Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Well, welcome to First Christian Church. A special welcome to any of our visitors or guests. Let's let our worship begin by taking our hymnals, turning to our opening hymn. I believe it's 618, How Firm a Foundation. And let's offer our voice in praise to God. Please rise. Good morning. Thank you for um, helping the worship this Sunday. Lord, blesses the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. They are like a tree planted by the streams of the water that yields its fruits in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all they do, they prosper. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you today for calling us out of darkness into light that we may, trans may be transformed from children of wickedness into children of righteousness. We boast in you alone for this work as as that your spirit would dwell richly in us, enabling us to hear and understand your word this morning. Continue to shape us into likeness of Christ. Jesus, as we worship you, we pray. We ask all these, all in the name above every name, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debtors 
as we will give our attendance. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. And now would you bless your neighbors by passing the peace of Christ. Today for our prayer, we're going to be reflecting on a passage of scripture from John 15. Jesus teaches that he is the vine, we are the branches. And the only, uh, the most critical part of any person's life is where their feet are found. Are you attached to the living vine, Jesus Christ? Or are you still kind of floating around looking for who uh, to find life and nourishment from? Uh, this morning we'll be praying for our friends and family that we care for, that uh, all of us would be found in Christ, that we could receive from him all the gifts that he gives of his grace and love and also for us to confess that this week many times we lived according to the flesh and not according to the holy spirit but finally to find the assurance that all who are in christ shall not be lost and that that hold is fast and he will abide with us our communion hymn is abide with me uh, it's an old hymn i hope, hope you know it but we'll be reflecting a lot on abiding in the vine today as the true source and strength of our life the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, you have provided for the nations a great gift, the gift of life in that abundant. You've given us streams of water. You've given us food and nourishment. And it's all found through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know Psalm 1 teaches that those planted in the Word of God are like people planted by the, a tree planted by the waters that will bear fruit. And even in the season without fruit, it will bear green leaves. God, we thank you for this life. We pray now for the mystery and the power of your Son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit to call out to hearts in our midst and beyond that lives would be rooted in the eternal vine of life, that people would trust in Jesus. We pray now in silence for our friends and families we've been praying for, that this would be the time and the week 
when they would become rooted in Christ. Lord Jesus, friend of sinners, who draws all mankind to himself, we ask for your mercy. And Lord, we also pray a blessing and a confession now because even those we that have faith and a relationship with Christ Jesus, many times we live according to who we used to be and not who we're becoming. We went from being professional sinners and now we're amateur saints and we tend to go back to what we're good at. God, we confess to you that we have not loved you with our whole heart. And we confess that we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Through the mercies of Christ, we confess to you our sin now in silence. O Christ, the Lamb of God, who takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. And finally, Father, we pray a blessing that we would look down deep into our, our root, deep down to the feet of our life, and see that our person, ourselves, our souls are truly fixed into Christ, that you have held us fast, that none should be lost, we thank you, Father, that it is by your, your power and sovereignty that we are consistently held firm into the grace of Christ, the Good Shepherd. And as we look down, Father, may we recognize that that is mercy given to us to be used to live a life of freedom and a life of love. May this service, Father, allow us to pull into ourselves the true life and nourishment that comes by faith. May the fruit of the vine be displayed on our lives. May love and joy, peace, all the fruit of the Spirit be manifest on your church. May we share it with the world. And may we testify to the true vine. As we meet with you at your table through your Son now, grant us the gift of repentance and the gift of growth as we receive gifts from God. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
Our great hope is God's ability to be faithful. And to that, I feel pretty good. God makes promises. God keeps promises. And we are the recipients of all the benefits. To the faithful, even when we're broken, even when we're confused, even when we have no light of our own, God is our light. God made a promise to His Son, Jesus Christ, before the world began, that He would draw unto Himself a bride. That bride would be kept until the final hour. At that final hour, the bride of Christ would be raised from the dead into the resurrection, and that we would live eternally with God forever. This is the gift of God to His Son, Jesus Christ. And now we get to stand on the basis of His Word and receive from His sacrament a reminder of the greatest feast which is coming. Jesus Christ gave Himself for us. And He gave us the emblem of this through the Holy Sacrament by taking a loaf of bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And He said, This is My body, which is broken and is given for you. Take and eat all of you. Whenever you gather and you eat from this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. God our Father, in every season of our lives, we know we can come to you and find renewal. When we are in sorrow, we come for comfort. When we are afraid, we come for strength. In times of joy and celebration, we come in deep thanksgiving. But whatever our circumstances today, we come together to this table, to you who sustains us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of your Son who died in our place, that our sins would be remembered no more. As we take this bread, renew in us a right spirit that we might love you fully and serve you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 After the meal, our Lord Jesus took a, a cup of wine. He blessed it. He thanked the Father for it. And then he said, This cup has become a new covenant between God and his people. It is filled with my blood for the forgiveness of sins for many. Take and drink all of you. And whenever you gather and you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we praise your name. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence with us as we gather around your table to celebrate Holy Communion. As we take this blood, Father, let us remember the love and sacrifice that Christ made for each one of us. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
Dearly beloved of God, as we prepare to share from the cup, let us first proclaim the faith that we share from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Football season has started, which means for six Saturdays in Lubbock, Texas, it's going to get a little crazy. Especially around uh, Broadway and Avenue X. But it's also a great opportunity for our church to uh, uh, support local missions. One of the missions that we've done the last few years is take our parking lot fundraiser and partner with Casa, Boys Ranch, uh, children's Home, Family Promise, and through a series of volunteers and, and effort, we raise $1,800, sometimes $2,500 for just a couple hours' work. I think I mentioned CASA. I hope I mentioned CASA. Uh, and just for a couple, few hours' work, a lot of money is raised, and we give it away. This is something we don't think about very often, but God has blessed our congregation financially over the last few years, and we've been able to do certain improvements, certain things that are really necessary. This past uh, spring and summer, we resurfaced the parking lot, restriped it. I hope you like it. It's super nice. Uh, but more than that, it's not just for us to park in, it's for us to host many others in. And uh, we've done an excellent job at doing that. There's a, I joked before that I'm not superstitious, I'm just a little stitious. But I believe that God will give to you if he can give through you. And I've seen God give through First Christian Church just in the five years I've been here, and I know that's gone on since 1901. We don't think very often about what, our, what does our parking lot mean to this community. A parking lot means a lot to CASA. Our parking lot means a lot to the boys' ranch and to the children's home. Our parking lot means a lot to, lot, means a lot to Chimmies, too, by the way. But the, the way God has blessed us to take care of the property he's given us has been used directly to influence and impact the least of these in our community. May we continue to be generous, and may God continue to give through First Christian Church into the nations for the sake of his glory. We will now receive our tithes and offerings.
Lord, we do pray that you would continue to shape us as we become like you as givers. For you gave everything. You gave your only begotten Son. God, to be generous is to be like God. We also pray, Father, that you would continue to give through us to the right things and the right causes. We pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct every penny, every ounce of energy that's flown through your church, that it would be done for the sake of your glory and for the praise of your name. May it be, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and the children are invited forward. Good morning. So we are spending the next four weeks learning about Joseph. So today we're going to see how Joseph trusted in the Lord even in hard times and how we can too. So Parker, he is going to read our scripture this morning. The trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Per Proverbs 3 5. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from Luke 14, 25 through 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower? Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. 30 saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send delegation with the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have, can, you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manor pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. The word of God. Let's pray. Father, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable all of the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts to be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. 
O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Jesus, our Lord, is after he has food with a group of people, he's off walking again. And as he's walking, large crowds begin to follow him, and he turns around to the crowds and says what he says here. Now clearly what he's doing is telling the group that many of them that are actually in the crowd, they're not there for the reasons that he's seeking. I've uh, joked with Valerie, I rarely, I hope nobody works for Walmart here, but I try to avoid going to Walmart, and I've really enjoyed the new option to pull up and they bring your groceries to you. By the way, where have these employees been? They're amazing. But I joke, I don't like to go to Walmart for multiple reasons because, you know, it's big and the checkout lines are long, and, but the real reason is not everyone there is, is there to shop. Have you ever noticed you've gone to Walmart and there's people just standing around? Like, what are you doing? Well, I gotta stand here, I gotta stand here, stand at home, go to the mall, I don't know, I thought I'd come to Walmart. So, in the same way that I don't really like to go really to any grocery store, because there seem to be people just generally milling about, enjoying their afternoon in the middle of the aisle, uh, when I'm trying to be in like a Navy SEAL, in and out. So it is with Jesus, you've got these People that are following him, the crowds are getting bigger and bigger. And I mean, which, what religious leader doesn't want a huge following? I'll tell you, Jesus. Who doesn't want the big following? The man, Jesus Christ, who was sent to seek out and save the lost children of God, to bring the people of God to the bosom of God and to raise them up on that final day. And he looks around these people who followed him and he notices the hearts of men Many of them are not there for the right reason. <clears throat> Everyone wants bigger. Everyone wants uh, to have the biggest church and the biggest following. And uh, Everyone wants to beat Clemson in football. We lost. We went with 10,000 men. They have 20,000 men. We didn't drop terms. And we lost. Everyone wants big, they want to dominate, they want to be large, they want to, they want to have the big, the big show. And so it, you take a church, for instance, if that's the goal, to have as many people as possible, today's scripture would not be preached very often, if at all. Because today's scripture is intended to thin the crowd. Jesus saw the crowd was large, he turned around and he said what he said, because he wants people to know, and I pray that this would strike all of our hearts today, that there have always been, among the saints of God, people faking. And may today's teaching from the scriptures be a great assurance or a great opportunity to hit our knees and tell God, I don't want to be a fake. Churches are filled with all sorts of reasons to be here. Some like to go to church primarily because they've always gone to church, and others want to be part of a traditional church like ours. They finally found a church that's teaching tradition and has communion each week, says the Lord's Prayer, so they want to come to a church like that. Other people love the people, and they just want to be, you know, part of a large group of nice people, which we are, by the way. We're very nice. Uh, by the way, I mean, I, I've I'm shocked at some of the stories I get from many of my colleagues. I don't have to put up with the things they do. Y'all are very, very loving people, and I count myself a loving person. Now, other people go to church because uh, they're drawn into the history of the local church. Our church has been here since 1901. In fact, I notice sometimes if I'll preach a, uh, a sermon on the history of our church, I get a lot of fan mail. But if I preach a difficult text, I don't get any fan mail, you know? And, and so Jesus is speaking out to the crowds that follow him to the saints who've been drawn to him and he sees different reasons people are there but then there's one reason that there's a person there and that reason is because God the Father has laid claim on that one, filled them with the Spirit, drawn them to the Son, wrote their name down in a book called the Book of Life, knows them by name, knows every hair on their head, is glorified in their resurrection, brings them in the final golden city of the New Jerusalem in the end of time and will watch that person praise the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit perfectly. Is that you? 
where Jesus in the next chapter that we'll look at next week in John or Luke 15 goes out to seek and save the lost sheep. Sheep and goats. Sometimes goats mix in with the sheep. Charles Spurgeon mentioned he fears the day when it's no longer the word of God and the pastor feeding the sheep. Instead, it's a clown entertaining the goats. And so here Jesus is preaching a a church, not church growth sermon, a church shrink sermon by saying two things. If you're following me, that's not enough. It's not enough. There's two things. Number one, he uses the word hate and then he uses the word carry the cross. It's not enough to follow Jesus. You have to be changed. We know John 3.16, a man cannot enter the kingdom of God lest he be born again or unless... Uh, He's been born again. He cannot even see the kingdom of God with his eyes until he's been born again. And here Jesus is saying to this crowd, you have to do more than follow me. There's got to be something deeper. And so he adds these teachings about ability. If this person doesn't do this, then they cannot. Cannot literally means physically unable. For instance, Sadie got stepped on by a horse and was physically unable to use her leg. Now she's physically able to use a walker. Amen, right? And pretty soon she's going to be kicking soccer balls again. But there was a moment when she was physically unable. God has healed her with time and help. And so it is for all people. We are unable to be a disciple of Jesus Christ until these two things are able until these two miracles are produced in the heart of a person. The first one, the most difficult probably, is if anyone comes to me yet does not hate his father, mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot, unable, will not be able to be my disciple. We cannot... Please God with our flesh. And so the way it normally works is that people come to church or they come to Christ or church camp or they watch on TV or try to give their life to God. And what it looks like is they still root in the things they were rooted in before they met Jesus as their strength. That might be your family name. I come from a good family, and I have a lot of pride in my family, and I I might find my source of security, my source of future, my source of meaning in the Carpenter family. Or it might be uh, your vocation. You come a long line of teachers, and you believe in the the gift of teaching, and I'm going to learn to do this well. I'm a a teacher. Me against the world, I'm teaching as best I can. Or or maybe you're a church member, and and you go to church, or you join the Rotary Club, or you're just a good person. And so you root deeply in the things that an unbeliever could root in. And then you'll bring the fruit of that labor and bring it to God and say, here you go. Are you impressed? What Jesus is saying here is no longer can you bring me the fruit of your life that's based on your carnal living that everyone else does. For instance, I coach a soccer team. We got dealt a horrible loss on Saturday. It was amazing. Uh, Turns out the team we played coached Stone's kids for Texas Tech soccer, the soccer coach. Yeah, thanks. So I'm going to have to call the Aggie coach to come up here, (laughs) give me his kids. And the the, the assistant coach is Coach Stone's wife. So I'm going to have the Aggie coach's wife to come be my assistant coach or the head coach. But you know, what we'll try to do is, is I'll go out there and try to coach our team to bring God a win, to, to say, look what I did. Are you pleased with me? Or I even gave you the credit, God. I, I told the kids about you, and I do. I tell, we pray and we tell the kids about Jesus. God, look at, look at what I'm doing for you. And this is the opposite of what he, is he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to stay planted in our old selves, bringing our old selves to him. Instead, he wants to become our vine our 
life, our root. And so no longer is it me bringing God a soccer win. Instead, it's Christ filling me up because I'm rooted in Him and I'm bringing the soccer team Christ. I'm bringing my wife Jesus. I'm bringing my kids the Holy Spirit. I'm bringing my church family the love of God. I'm not rooted in the world bringing God the world. I'm rooted in Christ bringing Christ to the nations. You see, so many people try to follow Jesus and honor Him with carnality. Secular goals, secular striving, secular thoughts, but don't spend 10 minutes in their prayer closet a week. We spend 8, 10, 12 hours a day at work. I only work on Sundays, but some of y'all work all week. Or we'll, we'll read books, or we'll, we'll strive, or we'll just waste time on the internet. And that's our life. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. You see, the deal is, is that God doesn't look around the planet and find what he's looking for. He, he creates what he's looking for. And he'll create it in you. He'll create it in me. If Christ is our vine. And then we go take what God gives us and we go show it to the nations. And we say, taste this. See, God is good. We don't bring God the world. We bring the world God. And so that's number one. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you've got to be able. And it's, it's a miracle. It's, this is not natural or normal. It's a miracle to find your strength, your hope, your nourishment, your meaning in a man named Jesus Christ who died on that hill far away and whoever liveth today to find your life song in Christ. He looked out in that crowd and he found people who were there because he'd already fed 5,000 people. He was a miracle worker. He said some really neat things and they're coming to him with their carnal life and he turns around and says, you cannot bring me an offering of your flesh. From the beginning, he rejected Cain's offering. He accepted Abel's offering because Abel's was rooted in a relationship with God. So that's the first thing he says to thin the crowd. He, instead of having the biggest church in town, he wants it to be uh, uh, full of sheep, people who are actually regenerate, people whose lives are committed to Jesus Christ, people who aren't using church for business deals or using church for a resume or for volunteer hours, college students. He's not, not using church for anything other than giving Christ what he paid for, which are a bunch of people who find their hope and joy and love in him alone and then go show him out to the nations that's number one. Following him is not enough. You have to find the source of life in him alone. The second thing he says is, if anyone does not carry his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. He's unable. You can uh, <clears throat> listen to Christ. You can tell people about Christ, but if you still hate this, and if this is not with you, you cannot be His disciple. What does this mean? What is the cross? Our Lord Jesus Christ flipped everything on its head when he, by the will of the Father, knew that the only way to receive all glory is to empty himself of glory. The only way for him to receive praises and singing in all the nations is for him to be hated by all the nations first. Philippians 2, 6 through 11, Jesus Christ, though he was equal with God, did not regard that as something to grasp, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being found in human likeness. He humbled himself to obey God, even to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that's above every name. Jesus, our Lord, took the cross and then he hands you your own.
you cannot be a disciple. You can be a follower of Jesus, and many churches say that's it. That's not it. You can follow Jesus all you want, but you won't be a disciple until that cross is your new lifestyle. You see, Christians, we don't live for our eulogy. We live for the final judgment. And we are taught over and over again that the path of obedience, the Calvary road that we will follow with Christ is going to lead to an incomparable joy, to an incomparable gain, that we're going to exchange that for a crown. It's a treasure to deny ourselves. We mentioned last week to lose at life to win with God, to lose a football game, to lose a soccer game, to lose a business deal, to be slandered, to be criticized, and to bless and not curse. To lose at life and win in God is the Calvary road. He turned around to the crowd that day who wanted the blessing without the denial. They wanted the healing without the repentance. They wanted heaven without rebirth. And Jesus Christ looks at them and looks at the church today and says, you can follow me all you want, but you can't be mine. You cannot unless I have become for you your whole life. And unless my cross becomes a wonderful attraction to you and not something you hate. The most terrifying words in all the Bible, at least for me, is found in Matthew 7. At the end of the days when men go to God and say, Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus says to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. People of God, we have always been found to be surrounded with ulterior motives. We're going to be taking a look through the Pilgrim's Progress from John Bunyan in a few weeks. If you'd like to join us, there's, there'll be a sign-up sheet at the end of the service. And even in the John Bunyan book, there are people on the Pilgrim Road that aren't really pilgrims. There are people called pliable and talkative. People who do a lot of talking, but talk is cheap. Pliable, who goes a little ways, but as soon as it gets hard, he gives up. The people of God have always been surrounded with Walmart standard rounders. You know, you're going in to get food, and somebody's just standing there smelling their fingers or something. I don't know what they're doing. And <laughs> this has always been the case. And as we, as we consider our own walk with Jesus, you will not be saved in a crowd. God's not going to say, you 20. Instead, he will look you in the eyes and look at your feet and look at your heart and ask the question, where's your strength? And he'll hand you a cross, a road to bear with joy in your heart. While there will be people who walk among you that give Jesus all the lip service in the world, but despise the cross. My friends, as we close our sermon today, we're going to close with a prayer as an opportunity for all of us to look at the feet of our branch into the vine and ask that ultimate question, where's my life? As my days grow old, as my strength fails, as I come to the end of myself, where's my life? And that you would look up and see not just your frailty, but your strength. For the Lord our God gives Himself to all who call on Him and who have given up on boasting in anything except Him. Jesus Christ calls us to follow Him, to be sourced in Him, and to accept the cross as the way of life. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, in the name of Jesus,
may you convict us all today. We pray, O God, for those who are near you, but are not sourced in you, that you would provide the miracle, the ability that we do not have apart from Christ. That You would heal our inability and that our feet would be found firmly fixed in the vine of life, the rivers of Christ. God, bring salvation to all of us and none of us deserve it. Father, for those of us that are wrestling through difficult texts and learning how to walk by faith and not by sight, may we no longer find our strength and our future in our family, in ourselves, in our vocation. But may we find them in our great Savior, Jesus. And Lord, may we accept that the Calvary Road, the ordained path for all sinners that have become saints, will include water that will not wash us away and a great fire that shall not consume us but burn away all the dross that we would be refined in Christ. May we take our cross and follow you and may the nations know that we have found a mighty treasure in Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. My friends, as we close our service today, there's always an opportunity uh, to come forward to give your life to Jesus, to come forward to join First Christian Church, but all of us have the opportunity to sing with all of our heart our closing hymn to God, and our closing hymn today is the old rugged cross. Let us rise.